Hi, this is Terry Quick, and it's time for Sunday School. This is the First Baptist Church, and we are ready now to study the Bible together. I cannot tell you how difficult it has been to video this, this Bible study session. I have literally made six attempts. This is my seventh attempt, okay? I've tried six times, and there have been all kinds of technical problems. I apologize. Thank you for hanging in here with us. We are going to try our best to not let it happen again. But um, it is what it is, and I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're there. This lesson is going to be from Luke's Gospel, the third chapter. It is session six. The name of it is Prepared. Chapter three is about the ministry of John the Baptist. Um, it is about the forerunner, John the Baptist, the forerunner. So in chapter one is the the announcement by the angels to Elizabeth, to Zechariah and Elizabeth, and also to Mary and Joseph about the coming of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, and then the, the, uh, the birth of Jesus. And so uh, what we have here is now Jesus has been born uh, in Luke 2. He's born at the end of Luke 2. There is the uh, Jesus and, his, and, and Mary and Joseph have come down to Passover. Jesus um, is lost by the parents. They can't find him anywhere. Uh, and it, it tells us about the humanity, the humanity of Jesus. Um, all right, so here we are in chapter 3 now. In chapter 3 um, begins this, this passage, begins with um, Luke giving us some intricate, delicate information to absolutely pinpoint uh, within just a few years of when this actually happened. Now, that leads me to talk just a minute about the kind of person that Luke is. Luke, uh, and, and what I try to do, and I know I have some new listeners today, what I try to do is I try to give some, uh, some personal traits some personality traits of Luke, the, the gospel writer, so that you can get to know Luke. Uh, it, if you know the author of a book, um, if you know the leader of a corporation or a business, uh, if you know that person, something personally about that person, it just endears you more to the material, what they're making, what they're doing. And so what I've tried to do is, is bring Luke down to earth as a, as a real person, a real man. He's, he's a doctor. Uh, he was an employee. Um, Theophilus paid him money to come down to Israel and get the Jesus story. Apparently Theophilus, which means lover of God, Theophilus was a Christian and he wanted to get this story down. He wanted to get the event. Uh, he was also a Gentile. In fact, if you want to get the if you want to get all of the details about that we have come up with so far, just go back and listen to the first first um, 10 minutes of the last few uh, sessions of sessions one, two, three, four, and five, and you'll get all those, those um, personal characteristics of, of Luke. Now, the one I want to hammer on today is that he was a person. He was a person that had likes and dislikes and had certain affinities. Throughout the book of Luke, because he was a doctor, we see that he, he really um, paid a lot of attention to miracles. Uh, he, he also um, paid a lot of attention to people who, had, or who were sick and diseased and who were healed. So there's a lot, of, a lot of attention Luke gives that the other gospel writers do not give. He gives to, to people who are hurting and people who are suffering and struggling. He also uh, has an affinity, has a, um, a, a real fondness for people who are poor and how they're treated by the rich. He has a, a, a strong affection for people who are in the lower rung of the social, the sh social strata. He had 
Uh, he mentions shepherds, Samaritans, tax collectors, uh, Gentiles, uh, and peoples of all kind. Uh, he also uh, had a lot of interest in the Holy Spirit. You're going to see the Holy Spirit uh, more than you see in the other Gospels because Luke was trained and skilled uh, as a medical doctor in the in the Greek world, in the Gentile, the Greek world, the Greek philosophy, Greek medicine, uh, Greek culture, uh, the Hellenistic uh, culture. He was he was raised in where they had to have facts and figures, and um, and so God chose Luke to um, to speak His word to be recorded for us from the perspective of a Gentile, someone who wasn't in that Jewish community. And, and, and who did not have the Jewish mindset. And that's very refreshing. So that's a little bit about Luke. We'll continue to talk about Luke as we continue through the, through the book. Now, we come to John the Baptist, and I, I want to break this down. I have a real heart for John the Baptist because he had such a cruel ending. His head was cut off. Uh, he died in a, in, imprisoned. And I want you to re I'd like for you to read that story in the book of, of Mark. Uh, the, the horrible death and in crying out uh, he sent a, a word to Jesus Jesus if you're the promised one why am I in this jail are you the are you really the one or, or should we look for another um, he was he was depressed he was wondering God I know I've done everything you've wanted me to do but I don't but wh why why is my life ending this way so my heart just really goes out to John the Baptist. It goes out to the babies that were slaughtered uh, when Herod went down to try to get rid of this Messiah that had been born. And to their, my heart goes out to their parents. Um, my heart goes out to, to Jesus who was beaten. He did nothing wrong and beaten so severely, you know. And uh, I, I just, John is in that, in that small group of people that, uh, and Uriah also, Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. He was one of the 31 mighty men of David. And, and Uriah, uh, his wife was Bathsheba, and uh, David had him murdered so he could have her and uh, took her to be his wife. Um, and so John is just one of these people that my heart really goes out to. And I want to encourage you, because we're not going to we're not going to spend much time with him in, in the in the near in the future uh, in the scripture, and I really want you to to do some digging there. But we want three aspects of <clears throat> John the Baptist. Three aspects of John the Baptist. We want to talk about the man very quickly. We want to talk about um, the the mission that he was on, and then we want to end with the the message that he preached. Now, this little outline that I've created is different than the outline in our book, but that's okay. I want you to read the passage and come out, come up with your own outlines. I encourage all my Sunday school teachers to do that. Um, when I read through the text, things jump out at me as to how I want to present it and how I understand it. And so the, the, um, the outline in the book is great, and we are going to look at the outline in the book. But I want to first break it down to the, the man, the, the mission, and the message, the message, uh, in the message of John the Baptist, we're going to look at the outline that our uh, Sunday school lesson writers present to us. So who is John the Baptist? The man, he was proclaimed by the angel, and now his birth and his ministry is a fulfillment of Scripture. So John, the man, boots on the ground, man, is a fulfillment of Scripture, telling us, telling us that prophecy is true, prophecy always comes true, and uh, whatever has been prophesied will come to pass. Uh, he was um, a Nazarite uh, in the um, in Luke 1.15. Uh, the angel tells Zechariah that this son is going to be the forerunner of, of the Messiah. He's not going to touch alcohol. Well, that's a clue. That's a hint to us that he was going to be a Nazarite, meaning that he touched no wine, no, no alcohol. His hair was not cut, and he was to not to touch dead bodies or people who had touched dead bodies, not even if it was his, in his own family, to not be around them at all. Um, Nazarite means to be singled out special for God because God has a purpose for that person, a special purpose. And he was to be isolated from, 
from other people to um, to keep his message pure and untainted from uh, from temptation and uh, and from the world from the temptations of the world rather uh, some famous Nazarites were um, Samuel the priest Samuel um, he's the one that anointed Saul and then ultimately anointed David uh, another one was uh, Samson Samson remembers long hair and he was not supposed to touch dead bodies but he did he touched a, a dead he, he killed a lion and uh, and he was not supposed to, to touch anything dead and apparently uh, he, he, he violated himself violated his vows when he did that and of course he was not supposed to have relations with with women he, he did all he violated his vow many times but he was he did have a very special role in the history of Israel and so John the Baptist was a Nazarite he was promised by the uh, by the angels as a fulfillment of, of uh, a prophecy he lived in the wilderness in John I mean in in Mark uh, the first chapter in Mark uh, you can see uh, in those first uh, first few verses of Mark uh, Mark begins describing the <clears throat> describing the uh, ministry of John the Baptist and um, he tells us that he wore camel's hair he uh, and a leather belt around his waist and ate lo locust and honey. There, there's no other Bible character that we get that much information on what he wore, what he wore to work, what he ate for, for lunch, what, you know, belt around his, uh, around his waist. And, and he preached, stayed out in the wilderness. That was, his, that was his area. People would come to him to hear him preach. He didn't go to them. He didn't go all around uh, uh, Palestine he stayed right there and he was so <clears throat> different so unique strange even people would even today call him weird but he when he preached he had a, a magnetism that just drew people in and they were spellbound as he taught repentance and the Messiah's coming and get ready and prepare your hearts the scripture says um, Isaiah said a about this person that would come before Jesus, that he would prepare the way of the Lord, he would make paths straight, he would fill valleys up to, to be, you know, he would fill valleys up so that it would be level, he would bring mountains down, okay? What is he talking about here? Landscaping? No, he's talking about attitudes. He's talking about pride. He's talking about ego. He's talking about spiritual corruption. He's talking about this man will come and say, Listen, if you're going to see or hear uh, the Messiah, you're going to have to uh, begin uh, getting on the same page as him and stopping your evil and wicked ways and your, your evil mindsets and the way you do religion. He's going to expect this of you, and he can give you the power to live that way. So everybody who wants to know and learn about Messiah and be ready for him, you come and you listen. So that was, that was the man and also the message, and we want to move from the man to the message, okay? The message, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the mission. The mission was get ready for Messiah, and Messiah is not going to be as you expect him to be. So the man was very unique, almost weird, preaching a message that was, it was, that was hard on the ears, hard on the mind and heart, okay? But his mission was, he, he, he was sent to warn people that if you don't listen to me, you're going to miss Messiah because he's not going to be the one you think he's going to be. He's not going to be a conquering uh, king or general like David who kills Goliath and the Philistines and who takes charge and builds this great political um, uh, nation uh, and uh, an economy and, a, and an army and, and conquers enemies with the sword. No, if that's the one you're looking for, you're going to miss him. So he's warning. He's warning. He's saying, folks, he's not going to be, uh, he's not going to be this apocalyptic guy that's going to come out of the sky even. He's not going to come out of the sky and kill all of his enemies with, the, with the, his sword. Now, Jesus is ultimately going to do that, going to, in the battle of Armageddon, that's going to happen. But that's going to be in the, in the future, uh, from now. So it certainly it certainly wasn't back then. So he's saying he's not going to come out of the sky. He's not going to be a ruler on a white horse. You're going to miss him. He's not going to be 
a physical king of a physical piece of, of land. He's going to be a spiritual Messiah, a spiritual king, a spiritual warrior, a spiritual hero. And if, you don't, if you're looking for the one who wields a sword, you're going to miss him. All right. So we've dealt with the man. Kind of strange. Camel hair, suit, belt, eaten uh, uh, from the honey, uh, from the honeycomb and locust. And I can't even imagine. Did he take locusts and dip them in honey and crunch them? I don't know. Doesn't sound very good to me. Probably a lot of protein. But So now let's deal with the message. And the message is where we are today in Luke 3. Uh, and if you'll look at Luke 3, look at verses 1 and 2, that's the that's Luke the historian given all these names that you can date and you can find these places. Even tells who the who the Caesar was, who the governors were in the area, who the high priests were in that time of John, and then John's very own father. So he's the historian that has to have facts. That's what I love about the Bible. I love that you can go to these places and you can dig on these tells. Um, uh, tells are cities that have been covered over and over. They, they've uh, been destroyed, and then uh, a, new, uh, a new group of people would come and build on top of it. All over the, the land, of the, the Holy Land, you have these tells where there's, um, where you can dig down and find. You can find Jericho. You can find Hebron. You can find uh, all these different places. Uh, and so there's all this history there. And then, um, then there's the Isaiah passage. Of, of what he was going to be doing. He's, he's going to be making a, uh, making a preparation for, uh, for the Messiah. And then here is the message, okay? Here's the message that starts in verse 7. And folks, I just want to warn you, it's rough. It's not how I would start a sermon. Of course, I'm not John the Baptist, but John the Baptist, he started off this way. He said to the crowds who came to be baptized by him, now we're dealing with the message. What did he say to these people? Brood of vipers. Whoa, called them snakes. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Wow. He says, if you want to meet Messiah, look at verse 8. If you want to meet Messiah, you want to be ready for him. You want to be on the, at least in the same ballpark, at least the same stadium. He says, Confess your sins, repent. Well, what is metanoia means to change your mind. You gotta, you gotta not just feel sorry. You gotta stop. You gotta admit. You gotta change your mind, and you gotta walk the other way. You gotta live differently. Now, living differently is is proof, is fruit, is doing things. Stop doing things, but then start doing certain things. So listen to what he said. He says. Therefore, produce consistent, produce fruit consistent with repentance. In other words, there's got to be some proof in the pudding. You can't just talk it. You've got to live it. Now he's saying, I know you can't do this indefinitely under your own power. That's religion. And that's just gutting it out. And that's just making promises. And that's just turning over a new leaf. And that's just uh, New Year's resolutions. And, and you, you can't do that under your own power. There's no sticking power. There's no change. Okay? But when you meet Messiah, there's going to be a metamorphosis. There's going to be a change. He's going to change you spiritually. He's going to change your spiritual uh, genetics. And he's going to cause you to be born again. And he's going to cause, he's, his spirit is going to literally live in you. And you're going to be able to, to recognize sin and say no to sin because you are a new creation. Well, John's, now, John said, I can't give you that, but I can get you ready for the one who can give you that. Okay? And he says, look, don't come to me saying, oh, what do you mean we're vipers? Or what do you mean we're sinners? Oh, we're children of Abraham. We're Jews. He goes, that's not what takes you to heaven. Being born a Jew doesn't get you into heaven. Being born in a church doesn't get you into heaven. Being born into a denomination doesn't get you into heaven. Being born into a Christian family doesn't get you to heaven. See, John is cutting. I mean, I'm telling you, he is just, he's cutting hard at the heart. He said, you people who come out here with these haughty attitudes and, and dressed in your religious regalia and, and, and pointing your finger and snickering at me because I'm not dressed like you and I'm not, 
I don't have the degrees that you have. I haven't been to the schools that you've been to. But he says, I'm telling you the truth. Messiah is here. And those of you who are looking for a, a king to, to kill the, the Romans and to overthrow the enemy, you're going to a, a, an eternal hell because your Messiah is not a, a physical king, but he's a spiritual leader, a spiritual Messiah. Wow. And he says in verse 9, the axe is already at the root of the trees, meaning Messiah is here. He is about to cut the wheat. He's about to cut the tree. He's going to cut down the fake and the false and the bad tree and grow up a spiritual tree from the, from the root of David, all right? From his spiritual root that has been promised uh, through, the, through the centuries. The ax is, ready, is already at the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Folks, he's talking about hell here. I wish I could make it easier, but, it's, but, but I can't. I mean, this is John the Baptist. This is hellfire and brimstone. He's saying, guys, we haven't heard from God for 430 years. Messiah's here, and I'm the last Old Testament prophet because I'm telling you about the coming of the Lord, coming of the Messiah, and he's here, and he's coming to harvest the wheat, harvest the souls of people who believe and who are ready and looking for the spiritual Messiah, but he's going to cut down and haul off and burn in the devil's hell people who are not ready, who because of their own pride are saying, that's not Messiah that I'm ready for. That's not the religion that I want. I just want something to keep me happy and to tickle my ears and to tell me how wonderful I am and how to have a nice day and how to get along with my mother-in-law and all this stuff. Don't give me this hell fire and brimstone. Don't talk about sin. Don't talk about a cross. Don't talk about suffering. Don't talk about sacrifice. Well, John was all about all of that. And listen to, listen to the response that he got. Listen to the response he got. In verse 10, what shall we do? Some of them were just cut to the quick. I like saying that because I'm Terry Quick, but cut to the heart, cut to the soul. They're going, John, you're exactly right. I was raised in this spiritual, um, uh, this spiritual muck and mire, feeling like we're the promised, we're the special ones, and we go and do rites and rituals, but there's no peace, there's no joy. My rabbis and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, we know they're corrupt. And we're doing all this. They steal and, and, they, and they cheat and they put, uh, put heavy weights on us that we can't even, we can't do. And so we pay more money to be forgiven of our sins. And it's, there's no peace and joy and happiness in this. What do we do? The crowds were asking him. And he replied, he said, here's... When I baptize you, I'm not baptizing you to save your soul. I'm baptizing you for a new start so that you are promising with this baptism to re that you have repented of your sins, you've, you've recognized it, you're going to stop it, and you're promising me with this baptism that you're going to live the life that this Messiah is going to demand of you. I'm getting you ready. It's called This, this lesson is called prepared. John was preparing them to make sure that they could rec recognize him, not a conquering hero, but a suffering servant is coming as your Messiah, but also to prepare them and get them ready for the message. He's going to come out, Jesus is going to come out talking repentance. Repent. Stop your evil and wicked ways. Admit what you have done. Admit that you have blood on your hands. Admit all this anger and this hatred and, and, this, and this greed and this graft and th that these things are wrong and let them go and then stop them. But see, when Jesus comes into a person's life, not only are we able to see sin when, when it, it comes, but we're able to say no to it, and we're able to walk away from it and not just not do sinful things, but do things that uh, are of the Holy Spirit and things that are good and healthy and right. See, peace is not just the absence of war. It is healthy country that is healthy and educated and and, and helps the, uh, the, the, weakest, uh, the weakest people in a society, the youngest and the oldest, who are the most uh, helpless 
A healthy, a thriving society is one that puts most of its energy and money and time and care in the weakest parts of that age of, of society, the unborn and those who are aged and can't take care of themselves. You see, that's a healthy society. That's, that's not just the absence of war. That's peace. And that's what Jesus brings to a life. Okay, so he says, he says, um, uh, here, here are the things that, that you do to get ready for Messiah, that Messiah will bring to your life. Uh, don't take money from anyone by force. I'm sorry, let's go back to, let's go back to, uh, let's go back to verse 11. The one who has two shirts must share with someone who has none, and the one who has food must do the same. In other words, compassion. I want you to be a compassionate people. Stop just living for yourselves. And my people, Messiah's people, are going to, the, the, the hallmark, the earmarks, the characteristics are going to be individuals that are compassionate and also churches and groups that are going to be compassionate. The one who has two shirts must share with someone who has none. The one who has food must do the same. And so this is what the Christian faith, this is what uh, being a being a, um, a, a born-again Christian and a, a church that's full of the Holy Spirit, this is how they act, okay? And then tax collectors also came to be baptized and said, and they asked him, Teacher, what do we do? Can, can we be a part of the Messiah's group or family or organization? Can we? And he said, and he said, don't collect any more than what you've been authorized. In other words, what he's saying there is be ethical. Not only uh, compassionate, but be ethical in all of your dealings because the tax collectors were just, they were the bottom rung in society. They were called sinners. The whole group of them was just called sinners. Beyond help. So he's saying not just for the tax collectors, but he was saying to everybody, tax collectors and everyone, I want you to be ethical. So, so go ahead and repent of your sins of being unethical and cheating and lying and stealing and all those things. Uh, but I want you to be, I want you to be people who are, who do what you say you're going to do and and only take what, um, only take what is right, okay. And so he's saying to the tax collectors, this is the kind of, of activity. Uh, don't just stop it. Don't just stop taking money, but be, be um, a part of the solution in your, in your community and in your society. And then verse 14, soldiers came and questioned him and said, what do we do? We, we don't, um, and, and he said to them, soldiers, killing machines, Roman soldiers, Herodian soldiers, uh, don't take money from anyone by force or false accusation and be satisfied with your wages. What is he saying there? He's saying, listen, I want you to, um, to be a society of, of, of doing the right thing every time. Be righteous. Do the right thing, no matter what, even if it costs you. Uh, so don't use your position as a soldier. Don't use your position um, as a leader. Don't use your position to... Uh, to to do um, to, to fill your pockets or, or to get pleasure uh, because of your position. He's saying, my people, my, uh, my family is going to be built on compassion. But when I come into your life, you're going to be you'll be filled with compassion and you're going to give it. You're going to be ethical and you're going to show it and you're going to be righteous and you're going to do it. Every situation you're going to do, I want you to do the right thing. Now, you can't do this, John's saying, you can't do this just with my baptism. My baptism is, is temporary, but, but, but the baptism that Messiah is going to bring is permanent. He's going to baptize you with, with, with fire, with the Holy Spirit. He's going to infill you with his very presence. Now, there was a division about, from the people that said, wait a minute. Uh, who is this? Is, are we going to go with this, this type of Messiah? We wanted a, a king with a sword and to slay the Romans. And is this, is this the one we want? And so verse 15 
talks about the division. There was, there was talk among the people. Now, the people were waiting expectantly, and all of them were questioning in their hearts whether John himself might be the Messiah. He said, no, 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 no. I am not the Messiah. I know I am strange, and I know I'm preaching a hard word, and I know I have a lot of followers. People are coming from just droves and droves. He, he was a move. John the Baptist was a movement. King Herod was afraid of him. Even, even though he, he uh, put him in jail later, he put it, but, but he protected him and he was afraid of him. In fact, when Jesus came doing miracles, Herod thought that John the Baptist had come back to life again. So the people, um, so John answered in verse 16 and said, I baptize you with water, but the one is more powerful than I. He is coming, that's the Messiah, and I'm not even worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His baptism is permanent. His baptism creates a change, a genetic change, spiritual genetics change when you're born again. And you, you identify sin and you can say no to it and, it. and you have the power not just to see it and to stop it, but the power to do the right thing. And then in verse 17 and 18, it says, His winnowing shovel is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and gather the wheat into the barn. So he's saying, Messiah is here. Judgment is about to come. If you miss him, you're going to hell. If you receive him, you're going to heaven. But you can start heaven now. Listen to what he says. He says, he will gather the wheat into his barns, in verse 17. That's us. But the chaff will be burned with fire that never goes out. That's hell. So he says, which side are you on? Are you, are you looking for the right Messiah? Um, and, and today, folks, um, do we think that... that are we following the right Jesus? Have we followed the right Messiah? Are you thinking that just going to church and checking off the boxes? I've been to church. I gave money. I, I've, I've done my Bible reading. I've, I've I even listened online. That's, that, doesn't do, that doesn't save your soul. You've got to realize your sin and repent of your sin. And you've got to, to allow Jesus to come in and change your life so that you want to do these things. You have this compassion in your heart. Your heart breaks when you see people who have need. You, you are going to be ethical even at your own expense, and you're going to do the right thing. Like, like he, the, the message he was telling, this is how Messiah lives. This is what he's going to do, and this is what he expects of you. And the evidence that you are Christians is you live this way. You are these kind of people. Wow. Then along with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to them. He was talking to them about what the kingdom is going to look like and, and how the Messiah is, is, um, is, is alive. At any moment, he's going to step out, and he did. If you'll look at the rest of that chapter in verse 21, go to, go to 21. Um, he, um, he, in verse 21, he's, uh, Jesus comes, and he is... Uh, baptized. John says, no, I don't want to baptize you. You baptize me. And Jesus said, no, you're to, we're to do this because baptism is not to take sin away. It's the evidence that there's been a death and a resurrection. See, Jesus changed uh, baptism from, they, they thought it washed sin away. But Jesus said, you know what? It doesn't wash sin away. It is now, it notes, it tells people that I was dead in sin and now I'm alive because Jesus said, I'm going to go to the cross, and I am going to be dead, and I'm going to be alive. And if you trust your heart and life to me, you are born spiritually, stillborn, spiritually dead. But when you receive me into your heart, I will make you to become alive. That's what baptism is about. He changed baptism to a symbol, from a rite, from a ritual to a symbol. He changed the Lord's Supper from the Passover and eating the Passover lamb to him being the lamb that was slain. To, um, to, walk, to put his blood over the doorpost of our hearts so that we uh, no longer are dead. We are spiritually alive. Jesus changes everything he touches. Wow. And so, and so uh, the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus while he was, uh, when he came up out of the water. In verse 22, a dove uh, came upon him uh, signifying the presence of the Holy Spirit. And then, uh, Luke finishes this uh, his chapter with um, a, gen a genealogy uh, that goes all the way back to 
It goes all the way back to, um, to Adam because he's that scientific, that doctor. You've got to have proof. You can fact check Jesus' lineage all the way back through uh, David, uh, King David, which gives him a royal, royal lineage, and then all the way back to Adam. Wow. Wow. So, the man is John the Baptist. The, 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 the mission is don't miss the Messiah. Are you looking for the, are you following the right Messiah? And the message is repent. We cannot get to heaven unless we repent. Repent of our sins. We can't live uh, and find God's plan for our lives unless we live a life of repentance. Repentance is about, is about being heartbroken daily and hourly about our sin and giving it to Christ, putting it under the blood, and He, he washes, it, washes us clean of our sin and keeps that filter clean so we can hear God and we can talk to God. You see, we can, as Christians, we can never lose our relationship. We're always going to be sons and daughters. But if we have sins in our lives that we don't confess and, and change our minds and, and walk the other way, and not just stop it, but start something good in its place, uh, then the scripture says we can't hear God. We can't hear Him communicate with us. So we can never lose our, we can never lose our relationship, but we can lose our fellowship and our ability to hear God if we don't live lives of repentance. And that's what John the Baptist was about. Be sure you're following the right Messiah. It's a spiritual Messiah that causes you to be born again, that demands repentance, all right? But then to follow that Messiah correctly, we have to be repentant, live, live lives of brokenness and repentance and aware of our sin, and then not just realizing it, but stopping it and then living lives of righteousness that is following God's plan for our lives as we read our scripture, as we worship, and as we are involved in ministry. Thank you for being with us, and we will see you Sunday, and then we'll see you again next Wednesday here on, um, on the website and on YouTube. Thank you for being with us. Goodbye.